Like I said, this is an ordination service today. We have three ladies we're going to uh, ordain into the ministry. The word ordination basically means that it is an, it's an appointment. And it's kind of like uh, baptism. Being baptized in water doesn't save you. Uh, baptized in water is an outward expression of an inward work. In other words, when, when you're baptized, uh, it represents the, your death and your burial and your resurrection. It is recognizing Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. So it was a, it's an outward uh, act of an inward work that's already been done. And that's what ordination is. And it's very scriptural, and we need to do this. So we're going to ordain some uh, ladies into the ministry. Now, I want to say this. I, I know that some people don't believe in women ministers. Uh, some people don't believe uh, anything. I mean, you know, uh, you can't help that. But uh, I, I know enough scripture, and I know the scriptures they use to try to prove me wrong. But I know those scriptures better than they do. Listen, any text out of context is a pretext. And, and any time you read the scripture, you've got to know who's doing the talking, what are they talking about, and who they're talking to. Amen. I don't know if you know this or not. Hold on to your chairs. But not everything in this word belongs to you. I said not everything in this word belongs is talking about us. Amen. Uh, you know, it, many times it's talking about the Jews. And it's talking about the other church. But the principles, and it's all true. And it's all true. And many things are types and symbols of, uh, of um, particularly in the Old Testament, but also some in the New Testament. And so you have to be careful how you interpret the Word of God. Amen. I mean, it's not for us to offer sacrifices for our sins, is it? There's been one sacrifice. So, and that his name was Jesus. He was the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. So to go out and kill little animals and offer them up as an offering, that doesn't belong to us today, does it? He's not talking about us, is he? Exactly. Amen. So you need to keep that in mind when you're studying the Word of God. Who's doing the talking, what they're talking about, and who they're talking to? Amen. Now I want to start because we have ladies that are going to be ordained into the ministry this morning. I want to start in Genesis chapter 5. And I, now you, you can write these down or you can look them up, but I'm going to be going to several scriptures. But in Genesis chapter 5, it says, This is the book of the generations of Adam. Everybody say Adam. Adam. In the day that God created man. Everybody say man. man. When God created man. In the likeness of God made he him. God made man in his own likeness. And watch this. This is the clincher. Male and female created he them and blessed them and created them and called their name, their name, their name, Adam, and the day when they were created. Now, the word says also, I believe it's in the second chapter, God created man and said, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. That's the command of the human race. How many know that two women can't, re can't plenish, replenish the earth? How many know that two men can't replenish the earth? Amen. So anything other than that, he said male and female. But what I want you to see is from this that both of them, listen, this is what I just read. Male and female make up the man. A woman, the woman came out of Adam. A woman is a man. Woman, a woman is just as much a man as a male is. 
woman means that she is a man with a womb. Woman. He created man, male and female. Now it's important to know this because many times through the scriptures when God talks about man, he's not just talking about a male. He's talking about what we would call mankind, which includes male and female. Also, the word says in John, I believe it's, well, John chapter 1, he said to them that believed on him, he, he became, uh, they, they became sons. Sons. It says, so what manner of love has the Father bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God? Sons are males. But when he says sons, what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us, we should be called the sons of God. So does that mean when he says sons of God, does that mean just males? In other words, just males can be saved. Just males can be part of the bride, the bride of Christ, body of Christ. No. When he says sons, he's talking about man. He's talking about both men and women. M male and female. What about the bride of Christ? I am part of the bride of Christ. I'm a bride. You're a bride. Amen. We're all part of the same bride. Now, the reason that this is important is because, again, a lot of people do not believe in ordaining uh, women as preachers, as ministers. Now, I did this. I ordained a, a, a lady one time in the church, and I had a man, a family, a pretty big family that did not believe in women ministers. Okay. So he left and never came back. Took his family, left, and never came back. Uh, that's very sad. That's very sad. You know, a mind is a terrible thing to waste, you know. And uh, so uh, I, I've got minister friends. Well, see, they don't believe in women. See, the Bible says that Priscilla and Aquila were teachers. Priscilla was a teacher, a minister in the body of Christ. Hello. I know the scripture that talks about that suffer the women not to usurp authority over the man and not to teach. Come on, guys. That was in that day that was written. Women were not even allowed to go to school. They were not educated. They stayed at home, washed the dishes, cleaned the house. Biggest thing they did is they stayed pregnant and had the babies. Amen. So when they went to church, the same, you find the same thing over in 1 Corinthians. When they went to church, they would get out of order because they, didn't, they weren't taught any better. And so when Paul addresses this, he is addressing uh, situations in that particular church at that particular time. We don't live there anymore. Amen. We're not at the place anymore where women uh, just have to stay at home and they don't have any education. Amen. And all they do is stay at home and have babies. Stay barefoot and pregnant all the time. Amen. But anyway, as we'll go on here, uh, in Ephesians chapter 4, I'm going to go there. Am I doing all right so far or have I completely messed up your head? Well, if you're not messed up yet, you will have been a little bit. Just give me, give me some time. I can't do everything one time, you know. <laughs> Hallelujah, Jesus. I'm going to go to Ephesians 4. And of course, you know what's in Ephesians chapter 4. Now, in Ephesians chapter 4, if you go back to Acts chapter 19, Paul went to Ephesus. Ephesus was the main trade city in Asia Minor, actually uh, in all of Asia Minor. Uh, Ephesus uh, was where Turkey is located today, okay? It was a major, major, major city. 
probably, I, I, I studied a little bit about it, but the largest city in that part of the world. And Paul went there, and when he went there, he ran up on 12 disciples. And he asked them, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? And they said, no, we didn't even know anything about the Holy Ghost. And he said, well, how, how, what were you baptized? And how were you baptized? He said, we were baptized uh, in the baptism of John, John the Baptist. And that's all they were. So Paul said, well, he laid hands. Everybody say laid hands. He laid hands on them, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with tongues and prophesy. Now, that was the beginning of the church at Ephesus. And the church at Ephesus grew so much. It was the, it was the greatest church in the New Testament that we read about. It grew so much that the silver miners began to have to quit their job. It was affecting the economy because they mined silver to make idols out of. And once they were, became Christians and born again, they wouldn't do that anymore, so it was affecting the economy. Now, Paul began to preach in the synagogues every Sunday until they stopped him. But then when he, they stopped him there, he went to a place called uh, the School of Tyrannus, and he, for two solid years, he taught in that school, taught about Jesus and about, about Christ. And so you get the foundation then uh, of, of what Ephesus is all about, about the, the, ch the church, and it was the strongest uh, church that we see in the New Testament was in the uh, church of Ephesus. It was the most mature church. So Paul could share some things there that, um, that he probably couldn't share at a lot of other places and didn't. So in Ephesians chapter 4, it's very, very familiar to us, but he says, I therefore the prisoner of the Lord beseech you, this is Paul, to walk worthy of the vocation that is of your calling. When you have a calling, you have to walk worthy of that calling. There's a lifestyle that comes with a calling. And this, or, or, or your calling or your mission. With all lowliness and meekness, with uh, long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, and even as we are called in one hope of His calling. Now, some people want unity, and what they want is they want you to unify with them. They want you to agree with them, whether they're right or wrong, and they call that unity. <laughs> no, the unity he's talking about is one body, the body of Christ. We're unified in the body of Christ. One spirit, born again spirit, Holy Spirit, even as you are called into one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. These are the things that we are to be unified around and, and with. One God and Father of all who is above all and through all and is in you all. But unto every one of us is given grace. Now this is, what, this is what happens in the body of Christ. We want everybody to be like us. We want everybody to have the same grace. Hello? Uh, we think that because uh, we have a certain call on our life that everybody ought to have the same call. Well, the difference in the calling and the difference in the grace is something that's going to cause you to think differently. If you didn't think differently, if you didn't see differently, if you, if you didn't speak differently, then everybody would be the same and you would be unnecessary. Amen. But he said unto every one of you is given grace. Now we know all of us have been given uh, uh, saving grace according to the measure, but he, he's talking about gifts here, according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Therefore he saith when, everybody say when. Therefore, wherefore, he saith when. Now, see, a lot of people tell you, they teach this. I've got articles written about me in the newspaper saying that I didn't know what I was talking about, and he confused his own self in the article. He, 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 he uh, contradicted himself in the article. Amen. But this is what he didn't understand. He didn't believe that there were apostles and prophets today. Well, what's this? Wherefore he saith, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. When he ascended on high, he gave gifts. So the gifts that he gave, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers, did not exist before he was raised from the dead. 
Yes, there were Old Testament prophets. Yes, Jesus had apostles. Yes, there were teachers. Yes, there were shepherds. Yes, all of these things, but they were Old Testament. Amen. And being Old Testament, they did not have a new nature. So God's dealing with them, and their ministry was totally different under the Old Testament. You can glean and learn some things. Amen. But the apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers are new gifts, fresh gifts that only came. What's he said? Wherefore, he saith, when he was raised from the dead and descended on high and led captivity, captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. When? When he was raised from the dead. See, he wasn't raised but one time. Amen. And that's when these gifts came into manifestation. But there's another word here. Now he that ascended is also he that descended first into the lower parts of the earth. He that descended is also the same that ascended far above all the heavens and went that he might fulfill all things. And he gave some, not all, some. Not everybody's an apostle, not everybody's a prophet, not everybody's an evangelist, not everybody's a pastor or teacher. If they, if they sit under all these ministries, then there's a, an impartation that comes from all them, and you can operate to a degree in all of these. But see, uh, as I'll show you in a minute, these are, these are specific gifts not everybody has. And he gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the protect, perfecting, that is for the maturing of the saints, in other words, the apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers are given uh, for works of service to bring people to a place that they can work and serve in the kingdom of God. And it goes on to say, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, that is the building up the body of Christ, till or until. That's the other word. He gave these gifts until. We, it shows us when he gave us the gifts, when he was raised from the dead, but he shows us how long the gifts are going to be in manifestation. How long are apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers going to be needed in the body of Christ? He tells you right here, until, until we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a perfect, that is a mature man, unto the measure of the statue of the fullness of Christ. See, we are the body of Christ. The, the, the glory of God did not fill Solomon's temple until everything was in place. What God is trying to do today is get us all in place, bring us to maturity. Amen. When we come to maturity, we will affect the world, starting with our territory when we come into unity. But see, you've got 100 churches in this area. Why do we have 100 churches? Well, the reason is because we're not walking in the unity of the faith. One says one thing, one says another. Amen. Depending on what you were brought up in is what you're going to believe, whether it's the truth or not. Amen. So what happens, what confuses us, and the reason that we cannot understand the Bible as we should is because we were taught before we read the Bible. So then, when we read the Bible, we read the light, read the Bible in light of what we've already been taught, and we interpret it based on what we've already been taught, whether it's right or wrong. Amen. Okay, so he's given us, when did he give it, and how long is it going to be here until we come to perfection, and we have not gotten there yet. Amen. Because he goes on to say, henceforth, until we, we're no more children, uh, tossed to and fro, Cared about, and you know good and well, the people, I mean, there's more, <sighs> churches are splitting every day. Most churches in this part of the world are started because of a split from other, of somebody else. Amen. It's not like people are getting saved and building churches. No, it's just getting folks from other churches. Are y'all out there? I'm not saying that's necessarily wrong because it's here until we, uh, be more, until we mature, basically. And I won't read all that, but um, for maturity, that's why God is, that's why God worked in the, in the church. Now, there's five different anointings here. Apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. Okay. Um, but there's, and, 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 and they're all anointed. And they're all, anointings are a little different. And I've used this illustration before. 
a baseball, if you watch a baseball game, everybody on the field throws the ball. Everybody on the field catches the ball. Everybody on the field hits the ball. But there's one person who throws the ball, or two people actually throw the ball and catch the ball more than anybody else on the team. That's the pitcher and that's the catcher. Now the whole team throws the ball, catches the ball, hits the ball. Amen. But there are some, their assignments are different. And because their assignments are different, then they throw the ball and they, they uh, catch the ball more than anybody else on the field. That's the way it is when it comes to apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers. They all have their position on the field. Amen. But some of them, some of them are going to, uh, going to, their position requires them to throw the ball more and catch the ball more. Now, if they're alone, if they're doing that just in themselves, when somebody hits the ball, you know, they're still going to lose the game. Isn't that right? Is this making sense to you? Amen. I had a dream some years ago. Here again, not every dream. I dream every night. And most of them are, are nothing. Uh, I dreamed last night. Uh, but, but sometimes I have a dream, and I know that God is using my spirit to teach me something. And many years ago, and I was in the ministry, and uh, I, might have, I guess I was pastoring here, as a, a standing in the office of the pastor and operating in the pastor's gift. And uh, in this dream, uh, there had been a snow. And when uh, it snows, you know, it melts and sometimes it, it freezes back. It's called black ice. And so I remember I was riding down this highway. I know exactly where it was at. You go over a rise and then you, it turns at the same time. And uh, there was a shaded area there. So when you went over that hill, you hit that ice and you slid off the road. And I did that. I, I didn't know the ice was there, so I slid off the road. And when I slid off the road, I, I was down in a kind of a swampy area. Well, when I got out of my car and looked around, there were several cars. I don't know uh, the number, but there was just cars all over there. So I wasn't the first one to, 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 to miss the curve and to have a wreck. They were sitting all around. And I said, well, somebody's got to do something. Somebody. So I ran up to the, to the highway, and I stood out there, and when the cars would approach, I would warn them. That's part of my ministry is warning. And so I warned them. I stopped them. Well, positionally, that was not my job. That's the job of the state patrol. I was not a a traffic director, but I had to stand in that office until somebody got there, until somebody that knew how to direct traffic got there. Same thing in ministry. Sometimes uh, the gifts that are needed to build the church, they're not there. I mean, when you're starting, they're not there, especially. Well, so then other people have to stay and stand in, in other areas until somebody gets there. And that's what the Lord was really showing me, that I had to stand in that office of pastor until I was prepared and the people were prepared to accept me as another level of ministry. Amen. So he talks about apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. Now, this church at Ephesus was pastored by Timothy. And when Paul wrote to Timothy, he was writing to the pastor of the church at Ephesus. I'm sure you knew that. And so he had some, some things to say to him. Uh, and again, remember now, the church was birthed with 12 men. It started with 12. Uh, a church doesn't have to be birthed with 100 or 200 or 500. Paul started this church in Ephesus with 12 men, okay? And uh, spirit-filled men, okay? Um, so in, in Timothy, 1 Timothy, I'm going to go down through here because here, now remember this is, this is a 
This is a flagship church. This is the, the, the best church. Amen. So Timothy was actually, he, we would call him today a pastor, but he was a, really, uh, it, Paul started this church, so he was an apostolic helper. And so let's just look, because this is an ordination service this morning, let's look at what he wrote to Timothy. In Timothy 1, uh, I've got, is it a, yeah. Let's start in the sixth verse. Wherefore I put thee in remembrance, Timothy, that thou stir up the gift of God which is in thee by the putting on of my hands. So laying hands for ordination is true, right? It's right. It's scriptural. He said, by the putting on of my hands, he said, stir that gift up. You can have the gift on the inside of you, and it can lie dormant. There's plenty of people, I have no doubt, I've seen people start out in the ministry, very powerful ministry, preach, pray, prophesy, do great things, and then they just let that, let that fire die for some reason or other, and they quit the ministry. My goodness, that gift is lying dormant. That gift that the body of Christ needs is not getting that gifting. Think about all the gifts in the, in the women in the ministry that we can't get, that men can't get, because they don't accept men, uh, women preachers. Not realizing that they're not just women, they are men with a womb. Okay. For if God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and sound mind. Why is he writing that to Timothy? Because Timothy was facing some persecution, and he's having to deal with some fear. Be thou therefore, be not, be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of the Lord, nor of me his prisoner, but be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God. Wherefore, he says in the left verse, I am appointed a preacher and an apostle and a teacher of the Gentiles. So this is Paul writing to Timothy. In verse, I've already done that one. Um, first Timothy 1, uh, I might have got this one wrong. He said, The Lord grant unto them that ye may find mercy of the Lord in that day, and in how many things he ministered unto me at Ephesus thou knowest very well. And he goes on to say in the second chapter, and he's talking to ministers here. Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace which is in Christ Jesus. And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who are able to teach others. And he goes on and talks about the warfare. There's warfare that goes with ministry. If you don't know that, and let me just tell you this, if you're in the ministry, if you're one of these giftings, you're going to have a different level of warfare. I'm sorry. Endure hardness as a good soldier. No man that warth entangled himself with the affairs of this life that he may please him who has chosen him to be a soldier. Let me tell you something. The more you involve yourselves in the affairs of this life, the harder it's going to be for you to walk in your anointing. Second Timothy 2.15 Study. 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 As ministers, we have to study. Study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Did I not just talk about that? The word has to be rightly divided. Second Timothy um, 3. I'll start in verse 16. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for proof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Did you hear that? Now, let me tell you what people don't like from a minister. They don't like reproof. They don't like correction. They don't like instruction. 
I want to do it my way. I want to do it my way. That the man of God may be perfect, that is mature, thoroughly furnished unto good works. I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing, listen to me, and his kingdom. Watch this. Preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they uh, heap unto themselves teachers having itching ears. How, how much do we see of that today? People are running to churches where they make you feel good about yourself. Uh, where they, where they want to bless you no matter what kind of sin you're in. Where they want to make you feel good about yourself no matter what kind of sin you're in. Homosexuality, child molestation. But we got to feel good about ourselves. So we'll bring them in and teach them a good lesson. And we'll even prophesy over them what all God's got for them. Hello? It happens all the time, people. That's not a true minister of the gospel. That's, it may be a great motivational speaker. And we've got some good ones, but they, they don't understand they're not ministers of the gospel. They fill a pulpit and they make people feel good about themselves all the time. But they're not ministers of the gospel. See? The gospel involves suffering. Suffering precedes the glory. If you want the glory... You got to have the sufferings first. Somebody was telling me the other day, you know, different people can come up here, and uh, a lot of different ones can preach, teach, pray, prophesy. But somebody was telling me, he said, when you step up there, it's different. There's something different. There's an anointing that nobody else has. You know how I got that anointing? Suffering. You may want an anointing like that, but are you willing to suffer for it? Because let me tell you something. The sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed. You can't hurt. You can't experience the level of pain that some ministers experience without changing. You either become bitter or you become better. Pain will cause you to either become bitter or better. It's our choice. It's easy to believe God and worship God and praise God and tell God how much you love him. When everything's going your way, yes. when things are good, yes. hello. Yes. But when you're suffering, yes. when you're suffering and you don't understand, can you still worship him? Yes. Can you still love him? Can you still say, I don't understand, I don't know why, but you're still my father and I love you anyway? And I don't have the whole picture. Newsflash. We don't know everything. God does. Now watch this. In Acts the 13th chapter, and I'm going to finish up with this. Now let me tell you about them a little bit before I go any further. The anointing of the apostle can be imparted. Or let me just say it this way. Giftings can be imparted. If you have a true, if you're sitting under a true apostle, then the gifting that's on the inside of you, if you listen, if you're submitted, those giftings are going to 
be activated. You might not even know what's in there, but all of a sudden that anointing will begin to draw it out of you. See? They have the ability to lay hands on people just like Paul said in Romans chapter 1, verse 11, I desire to come unto you that I may impart unto you some spiritual gift to the end that you may be established. We just read how that the gift was in Timothy because Paul laid his hands on him. Amen. Uh, another characteristic is uh, uh, apostles raise up sons and daughters. Many sons and daughters, but it also raise up ministers, sons and daughters who stay and stand in the pulpit, who have a ministry. He said, son, not everybody's a preacher or teacher. You know that. But at the same time, the ministry of, of the preacher, teacher, the apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher is never going to be able to be successful without the ministry of the help, the ministry of helps. You see what I'm saying? Well, was it last week? Was it last week? We had T, a spiritual son. If you don't believe in my spiritual son, ask him. He's preaching down in Spirit of Life. Andy, a spiritual son, and, and Stephanie are over preaching in his church. And then Ann is preaching in this church. Three spiritual sons ministering all at one time, and I'm sitting on the front row. And I told Ann, this is what keeps me going. This is because, see, I've seen a lot of people that didn't get it, that didn't want it, that walked away, amen, didn't value, couldn't submit, amen, didn't like my decisions. Uh, lots and lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of people. Amen. But it, now, now I've, got, I've got some people that are left. I've got the remnant that's left. I've got sons and daughters. I don't have the quantity we used to have, but the quality has gone to a whole new level. Amen. Amen. All right, look at uh, Acts, the 13th chapter. Now, there were in the church. Everybody say in the church. In the church. He didn't say out there having conventions, <laughs> having seminars. <laughs> Amen. Amen. All, these, all these different uh, uh, things, I don't want to mention them. But that's not, that's not where the calling comes from. That's, that's not the church. When you turn the TV on and somebody's having a big convention and thousands of people are coming, that's not the church. There are a lot of good teachers and preachers that they're doing it in their church. And that's the right order. And the people that are out there just doing it without being sent by the church, they're illegitimate ministries. And there's bunches and bunches and bunches of them. Everything that God does on this earth has to come through the church. If it doesn't come through the church, it's illegitimate. That is not apostolic. That's people who can't submit to anybody else. That's somebody that can't operate and can't function in structure. It's not the pattern that we see in the New Testament. Here it says, now there were in the church. So there, the church was meeting, or the leaders of the church had come together to pray and to minister to the Lord, like it should be. Now there were in the church that was in Antioch certain prophets and teachers, as Barnabas and Simeon, that was called Niger, Lucius, Serene, Menaean, which had been brought up with Herod, the Tetrarch, and Saul. And as they ministered to the Lord and fasted. So you've got 
uh, teachers and prophets. Now, you don't have that ministry of the apostle mentioned here because Paul is about to be one. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, everybody say the Holy Ghost said. The Holy Ghost said, separate me Barnabas and Saul for the work whereinto I have called them. Notice they already had the call. They already had the gifting. But they were here in the church as a teacher or as a prophet. But as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, I don't know who it said it through, but the Holy Ghost said, separate me Barnabas and Saul for the work whereinto I have called them. So you can be called but not be separated. I know some people who have a call on their life, but they're not in church because, boy, I could use them. I'm thinking of one man, he's, he's so prophetic. And he's, he's a man of, of character, but he cannot function in a church setting. Because, see, there are always so many people that know how a church should be built. But they never built one. There's always that people that know more than the man up front who built it. Does that make sense? What if somebody was to stop and think about that? What about if, if you know, uh, what, what, if, what, did, what if I made a decision and it didn't seem right? It didn't seem right. It just don't seem right. We're going to tear down this big old building. It just don't seem right. But you know what? What's going to happen if I was right? What, what, what you, you think you think you want to know for sure God tell you this well what's he telling you did the Holy Ghost tell you that I was wrong or is that just your thinking and that's just doesn't fit with your uh, your mindset or your narrative you see what I'm saying but see they were in the church they were fasting and praying and the Holy Ghost said something. He said, separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I, have, whereunto I have called them. He's already called them. The Holy Ghost had called them. And when they had fasted and prayed, watch this, they laid their hands on them and they sent them away. Wait a minute, hold it. We got trouble here. When they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them forth. They did. The church did. The other ministries did. So they being sent forth by the Holy Ghost departed and went to Seleucia and from thence to Cyprus. Well, who sent them? It said Holy Ghost sent them. Then it said the church sent them. I don't want to go there, Lord. I won't go there because that could not sound good. They were publicly sent forth. That's important. When people are married, they do it publicly, basically. They did it, especially in the Old Testament. That is the traditional way. There needs to be witnesses supposed to be witnesses so there needs to when ordination takes place then there needs to be witnesses and today we publicly ordain three ladies if you will come right up here that have the ministry a call on their life You've seen, and you've seen the anointing on every one of them. 
You've seen the anointing on Stephanie. You've seen uh, she's teach, she's taught on, on Wednesday night. Uh, you see the teacher in her. But all three of these are being ordained today into the uh, pastor-teacher anointing. Pastor, because you guys have pastored and are pastoring now the young adults. Isn't that right? You're pastoring them and you're teaching them. Isn't that right? Well, Stephanie, she is teaching also, she's overseeing. She oversees the daycare, oversees children's ministry. Uh, and so all of these qualify. Every one of these are faithful. They are godly. They are holy women of God. That every one of you, if you be honest, every one of you have seen the anointing on their lives. And I'm going to use, they're going to be used in this pulpit more and more. Because I'm at the place right now, I am the overseer. I'm the bishop. <laughs> one, one, piece of, one piece of paper, one we've sent out years ago, and it referred to me as bishop. And somebody, oh, well, now he's a bishop. He wasn't a Paul, now he's a bishop. And the reason, ignorance, like I said, you know, a mind is a terrible thing to waste. Uh, a bishop is a superintendent. A bishop is an overseer. I am a bishop because I oversee. I don't have to be all, do all the preaching, praying, prophesying, all that. I don't have to do that anymore. We have staff meetings every Monday now. Everything, I, I oversee this, the whole thing, you see. But sons and daughters are being raised up to help me in a lot of ways that you, you wouldn't realize. You heard Andy talking about what these I want to call them girls. They've been here since they're 11 years old. I still see them as 11 years old because they're my daughters, you know. But uh, they qualify, and they will operate. See, you can have you can have many pastors in the church, many pastors. Uh, you usually you're gonna have one apostle. Because he's the one that has the vision. Uh, he might raise up other apostles. and But uh, there's no need for somebody to have an apostolic anointing on them if they're not, you know, building something, you know. So today what I'm going to do, I'm setting you all forth as an elder in the body of Christ. I'm going to do what the scripture says as an apostle. I'm going to lay my hands on you. Now this is what I believe. I believe that when I lay hands on you, that something's going to take place in your spirit. Mate broshobra kininita, brasenelete brakuri bukushe kinanamataya. For there, from this day forth, shall be an activation of things on the inside of you that you'd even know existed. You didn't know it was there. But after this day, saith the Lord, as you have been ordained by me into these positions of ministry, you will not only go to a whole new level in the anointing, but other anointings and other graces shall begin to flow out of you. So think it not strange. Think it not strange. Just go with that flow. Go with the flow that comes right out of your spirit because you know the spirit. You know my spirit, saith the Lord, because I've trained you. And you've been faithful. And you studied the word. And you stood. And I've trained you up to this point, saith God. And so from this day forth, some things are going to change much, much, much more for, the, for better. You're going to be more effective. Then you're going to have greater influence. Amen. And not only that. But you're going, Bakure Manasandre Indira Bakura Tabakitama. And because there have been those that have gone before you and broke and have broken through for you, you will not have to break through some of the things that's already been broken 
through for you. And you will walk in an authority and the enemy will never have the ability to stop you. Hallelujah. Mandokuria, but I shun that as an elder in the body of Christ, I ordain you as a pastor teacher in the name of Jesus from this day forth. Something changes and there's going to be a rest and a peace like you've never had before because something different and greater is being imparted. Hallelujah. From this day forth. I ordain you as an elder in the body of Christ. And you shall, you shall, you shall charge. You shall charge. Hallelujah! You shall charge into the enemy's camp, and you will win. And there will be those that fall to the left and to the right. And you'll be a light. I have placed you where you are, saith God. I placed you there to be a light and to shine and to show forth my love to those that have not been loved hitherto. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. And you also, saith God, I have positioned you. I have placed you in a place of authority. And that authority will increase and promotion will come. And you will be able to stand in your place in the kingdom as a statue, as a pillar, as one that holds up something else, something better and something greater. And so rejoice and be glad because not only in the area of ministry in the church and, to, uh, 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 and of the church and through the church, but even on your job and your occupation that I've assigned you to, you will be a great influence in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Somebody say praise the Lord. Hamakura bakashandrekea. Mando korita behese kala la motaya. Brashandre. Y'all just stay up here. La mokura da matea. Tikala la mokuria tabadike shetele da matea. Ila la mokushandre keto da matea. This is Stephanie's and it says, I charge thee before God and the Lord Jesus Christ who had who judged the quick and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom. Preach the word, be instant, in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, and Exhort with long suffering and doctrine. Hallelujah. Amen. Turn and show the people. Amen. Let them see. Somebody get some pictures. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah. Anatoria, which one of y'all are you? I, they, I also I also sense that your individuality is going to become more obvious. I mean, you have similar anointings, of course, like we talked about earlier, but there'll be more of a distinction, you know, in, in the way you minister. And that's okay. That's okay. Absolutely okay. Anna Tori, we love you. God bless you, sir. Turn around. Turn around. Hallelujah. Thank you. And Victoria. Yes, sir. Amen. You're the girl, right? I got you all right, then. Tell, tell me I'm not in the spirit. Come on. <laughs> this might be the first time. The only, re only way I can tell them apart is she prays the drums, she plays the bass. But uh, from this forth, from, uh, I believe from this day forth, your individuality is going to show up. And, I'm, and, and even I'm going to be able to tell the difference between y'all. All right. Who's getting pictures of this? Timothy? Timothy's doing it. Oh, yeah, y'all get a little bit closer here. Okay, yes, a little bit closer. Get some more. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let's give Jesus a hand and give them a hand. Hallelujah. Now there'll be some there there's gonna be some more of this and there's gonna be some awards and different things that's in the days to come because uh here again there are in, there's ministries that are still in process are going to be activated in others. Did y'all enjoy this as much as I did? Hallelujah. Everybody has a gift, everybody has a grace. Did you know that in a lot of churches, the churches I came up in, in this part of the world, God had to send me to Ramah to see something different and experience something different. 
But because uh, that's all I'd ever seen around here. But the preacher did the preaching. The choir did the singing. The ushers took up the offering. And that was it. There were no more giftings. There were giftings there, but they were never activated. They were never utilized because two or three people did everything. And so people sat there with the gifts dormant, just dying, wanting to be involved, wanting to be involved, knowing that something's on the inside of them. That doesn't happen in an apostolic church. It doesn't happen. Amen.